So I think some of you do research, right? So give you some ideas how we can do research in this area. Yeah. And I want also to talk a little bit about the theorizations of this learning. I think we are uh, academics, right? We do research, so we also want to understand the theories behind it. And then uh, I propose some areas for future research. Yeah. So, uh, so I will claim that seamless learning is a disruptive innovation. So traditionally, we have formal education, right? We learn in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then we have informal education, non-formal education. Uh, mm -hmm. That is done in the home. We are traveling to work, traveling to school. And they're not, the, the learning in these different spaces are not connected. So we want to disrupt disrupt these processes by saying that if you can connect learning in these different spaces together, you have more powerful, uh, enable more powerful learning to occur. So enable new purposes, processes, and practices, and new relationships between teachers and students, and perhaps changes the school culture and its connection with the community. So disruptive innovation, mm -hmm. A lot happened in the technology world. So, so uh, I think there's a lot of talks, articles. Uh, Christian Harbison, I think, uh, from Harvard University, talked about disruptive innovation. So for us, it's, you're interested in disruptive innovation in education. So the core principle is uh, innovation enables goods or services accessible to communities who have not accessed to them before. So the argument is that uh, by using appropriate use of technology, we can make learning possible in new and different ways to our students. So, so this is a trajectory of research. Some of you may have heard this. My colleague Long Xiang Wong came here last year and talked about seamless learning. Uh, so I just want to re recount, tell you the story again uh, of this. So we, we started our research more than 10 years back. Uh, Many countries are going one-to-one. One-to-one -to -one means one student to one device, one student to one tablet. So is that a, is that a workable technological model? Uh, it turns out that it's not, it's not working out in many countries. So some old news, ar news article, for example, in New York Times, show that uh, seeing no progress, some schools drop laptop. So, so there are many attempts in trying to do one student, one laptop in the 200 uh, in, la uh, in the past 15 over years. So, so this is uh, some news from South America, Peru. It says, uh, although a lot of attempts to try one to one, but many initiatives are not sustainable. So they buy the devices, they invest, they use it for maybe one academic year, two academic year, but they don't sustain. So there's another story from Peru in South America. So disappointing return from investment in computing. So there was an article that shows uh, you give one to one, but it's not working. So as researchers, we try to find ways, pedagogical models that make one to one sustainable and working. So that's where we introduce uh, seamless learning. If, if also the objective of trying to connect formal learning with informal learning. So. A lot of students, for example, do not see what they learn of. See, see only learning as happening in the classroom. So, uh, so you have to connect the everyday experiences, everyday life conversations to what they learn in class. So just the bridge is just to show, <laughs> the, we are trying to bridge uh, two different spaces together. So there's opportunity for seamless learning. Seamless learning to support learning that is not that's not uh, silo, that's not, that's not happening in certain learning spaces, but it's continuous, continuous learning. So to see learning as more powerful, you can connect formal learning with informal learning mm -hmm. or non-formal learning. So you bring students to a science center, right? You bring students to art exhibition. So you try to connect all those non-formal experiences back to the classroom. Then we have individual learning so a lot of learning is individual, right? individual connection. Then we also try to connect them to social learning or collaborative learning. So a lot of that is happening now. There's a lot of social media, WhatsApp, you know, so Moodle. So a lot of this is happening now. But uh, mm. 
This is this is where it started about ten years ago. Try to connect individual with social and collaborative learning, and then learning in digital and physical spaces, uh, face to face in a classroom, and also integrate with uh, e-learning, online learning. So. So when, when you move from one space to another, one context to another, we really want to have some kind of uh, plan for some kind of uh, transition and integration processes so that the students can see the connections between these different learning spaces. So that's, that's where the design comes in. How do teachers design lesson plans to enable this to happen? So we showed, we do this research in primary schools, but we also we claim that you can these ideas applicable in uh, broadly, I mean, also in uh, university education and in adult education. So the key point is you learn knowledge, right? You learn knowledge in certain contexts, and then you want to you see this knowledge at play at different contexts. So you try to recontextualize the knowledge. So you learn some science concepts in the classroom, very abstract, but you go out to the field, do a field trip, science center, and then you look at the concepts in a different context. So the claim is, if you can recontextualize it, it's very much more powerful. So, we, so, so this is a story of uh, research work that uh, taken us many years, 10 years. <laughs> so we start with theory, proof of concept, implementation, then we have some kind of scale up. So we start with one class, then we move on to all the classes in the same grade level, then we move to uh, the grade level, primary three, primary four, and it will move to one school to five schools to ten schools. So there's some kind of scaling. Some kind of scaling means that there's some kind of uh, good results that come from research, some kind of buy-in. So and then uh, so it evolves. This innovation evolves. It's a kind of disruptive innovation because it's new. Uh, so we have a trajectory of research uh, that, uh, that uh, this slide briefly summarizes. So when it started, we, we worked with a primary school, so we developed science lessons through mobile devices. So remember, you're trying to make one-to-one -one have one-to-one -one work well, right? So each child is a device. They're given a kind of smartphone, and every child is a smartphone, and they, are, they do science activities on the phone in the classroom, and they continue doing these activities outside the classroom. So the teacher design lessons that have them do some of these activities outside the classroom and bring back the classroom to, to uh, discuss. So that's a general idea. So we take the whole science curriculum, which is meant to talk face to face in a classroom, and then we, we redesign it into a form that's delivered through uh, mobile devices. So, uh, so you try to connect bridge formal and informal learning spaces to help them develop some form of attitudes towards uh, self-directed learning. Because the device is with you, so you, 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 have, to, you have to do on self-directed learning. Also to collaborate with others. So, uh, so we have a framework to look at this. We have uh, four learning spaces. So two dimensions. You can do science learning in class and outside of class, right? And then you also can do it kind of plan, plan lessons and emergent lessons. So a lot of what happens is in the type one, in class and plan. So can we design some activities in type two, three, four to make uh, science learning even more interesting, engaging, collaborative for the students? Okay. So, so the, we, we have uh, some apps that allow students to do the science learning, basically, uh, uh, you can see these apps. Uh, it's a KWL, right? So students have to reflect what I know, what I want to know, and what I learn. Then they have a, they can have different tools to help them to construct their own understanding, construct, write down what they understand. So their comparison table. Then they can take pictures, pictures and share with the class. Then they can draw simple animation of, for example, in this case, sketchy. Simple animation of uh, some some science concepts, like plants growing. They can do a simple concept map, copy code map. 
So get students to make their thinking visible through using these tools to represent the knowledge. So what you see in the middle is a, a number of tasks. So students can click on these tasks and do these learning representations. So that's the basic idea. So uh, maybe now, it, now the mobile technology is more advanced. There's a lot of apps, you know, apps that allow you to do these kind of things. But that was uh, 10 years ago. We, we developed these uh, tools to help students to to express, represent their knowledge. So uh, I have an old video. I, I wonder whether I show it, but I still show it to you. Uh, give you a flavor of what this, uh, what the intervention in the primary school was about. So rem remember, this is some time ago. Maybe the technology has improved. The student used the kind of smartphone, which uh, which has uh, changed very much. They still use a kind of uh, uh, pen-based interface, uh, but the general idea is the same. The pedagogy. You can see from this video. Can you play the video, please? idea. So we have the tra traditional science classroom where all the students sit in rows like, like we are doing now and listen to the teacher talking. So we transform it in a form where students do have a phone and they do a lot of activities on the phone and they share the work on the phones with each other. 
So that's a basic idea where they can continuous learning of science lessons uh, uh, outside of the classroom. So, so that's key idea, seamless learning. And uh, <coughs> so we get students to create artifacts, artifacts using our smartphones and uh, <coughs> these artifacts can reflect the kind of understanding they have. So, uh, so, so this is what we think is appropriate use of one-to-one -one technology. And then we, as researchers, we try to, we try to uh, explore the students' learning, right? So progression of ideas through the artifacts they draw on all this. So uh, we just have uh, different levels of connection levels that are reflected by the different activities can promote different kind of uh, cognition levels. So that, that's what you share. So, so that's how we try. Uh, th this is the research part. So we, uh, uh, we analyze the students' artifacts and see whether they completed the degree of completion, the levels of reflection, you know, how superficial or how deep they are, how good is the concept map, how good are the representations to see the students' understanding. And then we have a different, uh, different variations of uh, using the mobile phone. So we also have location-based knowledge building. So we bring students to uh, few trips, few trips, uh, and then they use location-based to location-based. It's just like GPS. Uh, I mean, think about it. Ten years ago, you go to a place, uh, go to Malang, you know, go to there, <laughs> go to Malang, and then try to uh, pose your questions uh, based on the particular spot. In, in, in a map. The other students can come to the spot and see the questions and respond to them and build knowledge. So we call it location-based knowledge building. Sorry. And then we have a uh, experience sampling. So, so once in a while, students can capture what they are doing on the phone and share with others. So uh, experience sampling. can share uh, in situ experiences and they can be location based and the, the, to encourage them to post a lot we give them the idea of digital badges so they can earn points and get these badges so these are ways to to add incentives for students to use the mobile devices actively for their learning so uh, we have a bunch of studies uh, that shows that students learn science better, uh, quantitative research analysis. So I'm not presenting them here, but uh, in general, the students did better in the science uh, when they try this, and uh, so the school was encouraged and spread it to more classes and more grade levels. So, so that's the message I want to share. Uh, and then after that, uh, so I have a research team, right? Research team, uh, we have a colleagues and some of these colleagues they left us they went to other countries and they continue this research in these other countries so so research continue so uh, so we call it offshoots so the uh, civil science learning so for example uh, we say that you rely, rely on one to one right? you need a device what if there's no device can we use the technology around us ubiquitous technologies so, uh, so my colleague Long Xiang Wong, he did a new, uh, new research with uh, new schools to, to use all the technology around us to support this pedagogy. So there's no, it's no longer one-to-one, -one, but use whatever technology. So it's the same learning approach to make learning continuous, but use, use, use the tools that are available to us in a, construct, in a construct, construct, constructivist way of learning. So, so the new thing about this is uh, they develop a rubric to assess how the degree of seamless learning in your lesson. So we have a rubric to, for a teacher to kind of uh, assess uh, how continuous is the learning supported by this lesson. So, so if you move from one to one to all the technology around us, it's, uh, it's no longer the mobile device as a learning hub. But it's a division of labor. We use whatever technologies around us. So technology is advanced. So a lot of things are now on the cloud. Uh, so for, for, 
For things you can do on the, on the move, you can do it on the public transport. For things you need a bigger screen, you can do it in the school or at home. So how do the teachers teach? So they flip the learning processes. There are ways to flip the learning processes, right? So you do the online learning before class or after class. So we, they can extend the learning processes because the time for science learning is very limited, right? Only a few hours, a few sessions. So how to extend the learning process and connect across time and context? Sorry. And, how, and these activities foster students' high order thinking. And how did the students benefit from this? So they are more prepared to learn in different ways. You know, it's not just come to classroom. They are more prepared to learn in a flipped classroom, flipped learning. They are more prepared to be engaged, to be adventurous, and to be reflect, reflective, reflexive. So, so learning approaches that are like this, we claim can challenge the students to to be prepared for, you know, last time we used to talk very much about 21st century learning, right? So really prepare students to do this 21st century learning. So, uh, so in this sense, it's innovative. <laughs> it's really disruptive, le disruptive learning innovation. Okay, so, uh, and then my, my, my colleague went to Hong Kong and she continued the same work and the same approach, but science learning in, uh, in Shenzhen in China. And she used similar concept, but you should use the idea of boundary interaction. So there must be some activities at the boundary that connect learning in the classroom with learning outside the classroom. So, uh, so you use some, 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 some available apps like uh, Enquire and uh, some apps to support these students' learning. Do you, do you want to see this video? Do you want to see it? Oh, okay, we show a little bit. Can you play it? Okay, we play the next video. Uh, that's the idea. So design boundary activities when you design science lessons. And this is an example set uh, this example of a lesson plan. So you you, you you can't read it now, but I'll make the slides available so that you can look at it. So the important thing is at the last column is the boundary activities. And then they do science learning in Shenzhen is a city just next to Hong Kong in China. Ah, maybe I'll show a little bit of this. Yeah. Singapore, you can also cross boundaries. So you work in Shenzhen. Uh, and the next one shows that you work is working in Hong Kong. So another colleague, uh, Yan Jie Song, 
She also did a series of experiments in the Education University of Hong Kong. Uh, different kind of designs that implement uh, seamless learning in school education. So she has, a, she, she has done a lot of research to evaluate these designs. Uh, so she did a seamless inquiry based lesson in the primary school and she has her own kind of pedagogy. Uh, so there's a pu paper publication. And then she also integrated with a flipped classroom and create a 5D pedagogical model. And then she also used a concept called productive failure uh, uh, to, to flip the learning activities. So, so, so Singapore, Shenzhen, and then now Hong Kong. So uh, maybe uh, uh, we can also have it, have it in, uh, in Malang, in Indonesia. <laughs> so so th uh, these are different offshoots of uh, research designs. So uh, sometimes the word seamless Seamless is used very loosely. So, uh, so we have our own characterizations, definition of seamless. So, uh, so that's the point. Uh, so we have all these offshoots uh, of these seamless learning designs. Okay, so where are we now? So there's a lot of books now, articles, presentations on seamless learning. So recently, I think last year I published another book on uh, seamless learning. Yeah. Okay. So. And then we have also made available, share the lesson plans in science and in language learning. Uh, Long Xiang Wong did a lot of work on language learning. So, so in some sense, uh, we, we have these resources to share. Uh, just now, uh, uh, the moderator gave you an email. Feel free to contact me for this. So, uh, so there's a lot of reports on seamless learning. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, confusion when it's so when you introduce seamless learning to a teacher, the teacher say, isn't that blended learning? What's the difference between blended learning and seamless learning? So I'm not going to give this talk. I think Long Xiang Wang came and talked about this last year. Do you know where you remember? So the, the relationship between seamless learning and all these notions, all these different terms in uh, learning. So, uh, so this is a chapter in a book. Uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, I wouldn't have time to cover it. So, it's not blended learning. You know, similar learning is not blended learning. It's, uh, it's different. And in what ways are you different? Then you must read this book. <laughs> okay. So, so I, here we, 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 I just skip through the slides. Just spend a few, uh, uh, two or three minutes on, uh, so because it, we are academics, right? We must have a theory behind all this work. Okay, so what theoretical foundation explains how seamless learning works? So, uh, so this slide shows the different theories uh, that are relevant when you cross different seams, you know, different boundaries. So you cross individual and social learning spaces. You have notions of, uh, it's not individual connection, it's group connection. There's a term called long tail learning and peer learning. So uh, no time to explain it now, but uh, these are some of the ways we can uh, use theory to, as a basis. And there's some, some new understanding is really about how to integrate different contexts and merge these contexts to make for continuous learning. And then we can, uh, when it started, we used the idea of distributed connection. So learning is not just in my brain, learning is in my interaction with all the resources around me, you know, the people, the artifacts, the computer, the tools. So the notion of distributed connection and is, uh, yeah, you can use this to explain seamless learning and uh, Luxia and I have defined 10 dimensions of seamless learning. Uh, and we have new understanding of these dimensions. And so we start to look at this, uh, di these dimensions. They actually classify in very different ways. So this slide shows that you classify in terms of the context factors, the different modes of learning, and the different methodologies to learning. So, so you see research. Research can be add more and more depth to the kind of work you are doing. So it's taken us 10 years. 10 years, every time I do research, we must come back to theory to try to improve, refine our theory. So, okay, so, yeah. So this is another chapter in the book, so uh, no time to go through it. So, so uh, it raises the question, the boundaries seems between learning, is, is it a good thing or bad thing? Do you want learning to be seamless or do you want to be a, a seem aware? You know, as a professor, as an instructor, when they teach, do you want the students to be aware or 
of uh, these boundaries or do you want to blur it? So that's a question. So a simple way to answer this is uh, we want it to be seamless for the learners, but as an instructor, as a designer, you want, it, you, you want to be seem aware. So you're aware of the boundaries and the disruptions and then try to smoothen it for the learners. And uh, a, a way to approach it is to use the idea of boundary objects. So just now the, 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 vid the video in Sinton was based on the idea of boundary objects. So this is my last few slides. So ultimately it's developing a culture of uh, learning, self-directed learning. Uh, it's promoting the long tail of learning. Uh, so schools, in, schools provide knowledge in the tall end, but you want to continue, have the students continue learning, self-directed learning. It's a way to bridge support these different needs and preferences. So, so design for simple learning is about creating rich experiences. They are not just silo in a classroom, but uh, engagement where, wherever spaces the, the learner is in, in. So there are opportunities for research. Um, hopefully, aside you, I think, I think, I think Saida said that he, she has a team of students, PhD students interested in this. So uh, the themes are not evil. You know? <laughs> Seems are uh, not evil, they are neutral, but it's really about how to make them, uh, make use of them in designing and learning. So, so uh, we make use of mobile technologies. Mobile technologies can be more ubiquitous, crossing borders, boundaries, ages. And you can leverage on the, the more recent technology advancements like AI and learning analytics to process the data that's collected behind the seamless learning to support uh, this approach. So I acknowledge the team of people who work with me and uh, some of them have left, so, but they continue their similar selling research in uh, different contexts. So uh, that's the end and uh, thank you.